Over one and a half million people visit Stonehenge each year. Not only that, but a nearby A303 has a constant traffic problem because everybody slows down to admire the Henge. What many fail to recognize is that this sacred area is filled with holy monuments, which the public and tourists mostly ignore. The downland around Stonehenge contains one of the densest concentrations of Bronze Age barrows in Britain. There are over 300 within a two mile radius around Stonehenge. The area has been the subject of archaeological research since the 18th century, when many barrows were opened and their contents retrieved for display in museums. Stonehenge itself began as a Neolithic cremation site around 5,000 years ago. About 400 years later, a megalithic stone circle was built according to a solar alignment. This was the last of the great megalithic monuments of Europe, in a tradition which spans the entire Neolithic, and began with the arrival of farming in Brittany in France. But the completion of the Henge coincided with the most significant event in the history of Britain, the greatest invasion it ever saw. Within a short time, over 90% of the Neolithic peoples of Britain were replaced by a new race. Taller, stockier, more warlike, with wider skulls and more fair in complexion. These were the Indo-Europeans of the Belbica culture, the ancestors of we modern British people. The images of a dagger and 14 axe heads have been carved on one of the stones, and images of axe heads have been carved on the outer faces of three of the other stones. These weapons look like those of the Bronze Age, and these markings demonstrate the warlike newcomers' ownership of this henge and this land, as do the barrows all around the henge. Most of these barrows date around 2000 to 700 BC. They derived from a custom among the Kurgan culture of the Yamnaya people from Eastern Europe. These cemeteries developed over centuries, even millennia, even being reused as recently as the Anglo-Saxon times, because all Indo-European pagan religions recognized the importance of barrows, and so there was cultural continuity right through the Bronze Age and the Iron Age and into the Anglo-Saxon era, even though there were successive migrations of related Indo-European peoples. The Belbica culture emerged in Europe as the Indo-Europeans of the Corded Ware culture mixed with the Neolithic culture of Europe. Belbica archaeology spread across Europe, as you can see from this map, but genetically, the Beaker people of Holland were their own homogeneous group, and it is these who contributed most to the modern people of Britain. However, there were other Belbica people migrating to Britain. The Boscom Bowmen were found in a Bronze Age Beaker burial close to Stonehenge and dating to soon after its completion. This principal component analysis chart shows the genetic relation of these ancient peoples to each other. One of the bowmen, I2417, is closer to the corded ware culture of Germany than to his fellow British beakers. And this shows that he was even more Indo-European, with most of his DNA originating in the Pontic Caspian steppe. Looking down on Stonehenge from the south are the Normanton Down Barrows, a huge linear cemetery of burial mounds. One of these bell barrows Wilsford G8, contained amazing gold and amber jewellery, along with a ceramic incense burner known as the Stonehenge Cup. Another mound in the same cemetery is called Bush Barrow. A great man was buried within. It was excavated in 1808 by William Cunnington, who wrote the following account. On reaching the floor of the barrow, we discovered the skeleton of a stout and tall man lying from south to north. About 18 inches south of the head, we found several bronze rivets intermixed with wood and some thin bits of bronze nearly decomposed. These articles covered a space of 12 inches or more. It is probable, therefore, that they were the moulded remains of a shield. Near the right arm was a large dagger of bronze and a spearhead of the same material, full 13 inches long, and the largest we have ever found. Immediately over the breast of the skeleton was a large plate of gold, in the form of a lozenge, and measuring 7 inches by 6 inches. The even surface of this noble ornament is relieved by indented lines, checks and zigzags, forming the shape of the outline and forming lozenge within lozenge, diminishing gradually towards the centre. We next discovered, on the right side of the skeleton, a very curious perforated stone, some wrought articles of bone, many small rings of the same material and another lozenge of gold. As this stone bears no marks of wear or attrition, I can hardly consider it to have been used as a domestic implement, and from the circumstances of it being composed of a mass of sea worms or little serpents, I think we may not be too fanciful in considering it an article of consequence. This stone is an axe head or mace, very much like those found in a ritual context in the battle axe culture of Scandinavia, itself a variant of the corded ware culture. The stone axes there are agreed to pertain to a cult of the Indo-European Thunder God, 
therefore akin to the Hammer of Thor, and as in the bell beaker example, they too were used in burials. The Neolithic Europeans had stone cairns and long barrows, which were communal funerary monuments, while Indo-European barrows are initially dedicated to one great person, and then subsequently used for other burials. In the bell beaker culture, both men and women were accorded barrow burials. In many cases, the corpses were carefully laid with the head to the south and the feet to the north. Men faced east and women faced west. Those bowl barrows on Pretty Hill overlooking Stonehenge are made all the more prominent because the beaker folk built them directly on top of the Neolithic stone cairns. An aggressive demonstration of cultural replacement. The final stage of activity at Stonehenge itself dates to after the beaker invasion and this is a time when the stones were moved very clumsily around. They weren't even secured into their new positions in the proper way, and therefore some fell over. We can be quite certain that this work was not by the original builders, but by the newcomers. Were they trying to realign the blue stones according to their own sacred astrology? Or perhaps they were just trying to disrupt what they perceived as an evil magic that had been worked by the original builders? Basically, the landscape of Stonehenge and the archaeology of the area is telling the story of what happened not just around the Salisbury Plain uh, at the end of the Neolithic, but actually what happened across Britain. Because that's what the paper allowed et al. from 2018 demonstrated from looking at the genetics of people from Neolithic Britain and everyone after, is that there was a big shift of over 90% of the DNA. A lot more research has to be done into exactly how this changeover took place. Was it a genocide? What, did the newcomers carry a plague and that they'd simply accidentally killed all the natives? And to what extent did these newcomers adopt the culture of the natives? It was formerly believed that the Bell Beaker people were involved in the construction of Stonehenge and some Beaker burials from around the Stonehenge area have in the past been portrayed as Stonehenge builders. But since we know it started being built so long before the Beaker people arrived and that it finished sometime around just when they were getting there, we can be pretty sure that they weren't really involved in it to a great deal. Unless, perhaps, they were invited as migrant workers to help finish off the project. But we do know that the Beaker people did do some things to Stonehenge. Not only were those carvings of weapons done in the Bronze Age, but there was also an attempt in the later stages, a third stage of Stonehenge, they call it, to move the stones around. The big stones in the centre of the Henge were moved into the horseshoe shape they're in now. We know that this was done by Beaker people because the big holes that the stones had formerly been in were filled up with mud which had pieces of beaker pottery inside. So this is definitely after the Neolithic people are gone. But why were the beaker people messing around with this monument? You may notice that the central horseshoe shape within Henge is actually pointing towards the solar avenue that leads into it. So maybe a lot of the solar alignments were actually done by the beaker people. Indo-Europeans often thought to be sun worshippers, so that's possible. Well, since the, the stones that were moved by the beaker folk fell down again afterwards, it shows the beaker folk didn't come from a tradition of making stone circles. They didn't really know what they were doing. The Neolithic people did it for a thousand years and they, they got to the peak of that skill set by Stonehenge. It's the final monument of the megalithic culture of Europe and it's the biggest and the best one too. But the beaker folk did try and move things around. Maybe they were influenced by it, they just thought it was so cool but they didn't really do very much and they didn't make any stone circles anywhere. They did, however, make wood circles because the nearby so-called Wood Henge and in Norfolk there's another wooden thing called Sea Henge. Now, it's debatable whether these are actually anything to do with stone circles, but they're often marketed as being henges so that they can be compared to stone henge. Well, they were made by the Beaker folk, so that shows that perhaps wood was more the, the material that the Indo-European newcomers were used to working with. They weren't comfortable moving big stones around, so they may have been influenced to make these stone, these wooden circles, having looked at the old stone circles. It has formerly been speculated that the Beaker people may even have been involved with the moving of the sarsen stones from a long distance away. I really don't believe that theory is correct. I think the narrative of the construction of Stonehenge needs to be reassessed in the light of the genetic evidence that was released in papers last year. How is it possible for true cultural continuity to occur 
when 90% of the population die or disappear. I don't, whether it was because of war or disease or whatever, it doesn't matter. That's not a conducive environment for the, this carrying on of a culture. And the people who brought their own culture with them, why would they willingly give it up anyway to a people who were on their way out? It doesn't seem likely to me, and there's not evidence of cultural continuity, so until it's proven properly, we should assume that the Beaker people replaced the other culture as well as replacing them genetically. The Boscombe Bowman I mentioned before, that burial has been used as an argument for cultural continuity from the Neolithic people to the Bell Beaker people as well, because when it was found, there's all these different people in a shared grave. As I said, the Beaker people generally focus on one person or like a small group of people. Now, the thing is, it might not be the case that that was a mass grave in the sense of a communal grave. Even before the DNA samples of the two Boscombe Bowmen were released, there was a big theory going around on the internet that the Boscombe Bowmen were a family. That there was one guy and he had been buried uh, with a skeleton and then many of the urns with cremated remains were his family members, his children. Um, and that seems to be quite accurate, except that they can't be his children now that we know that these two uh, samples that were taken weren't uh, father and son. They were relatives, though, of the third degree, which means possibly cousins. But interestingly, you can see on the PCA I posted earlier that one of them is plotting like a corded wear guy from Germany and the other one is plotting like a beaker person from France. That shows that there was a lot of diversity in their ancestry, even though they were cousins. So basically their paternal line is what they shared, a patriarchal bell beaker Indo-European lineage. And we know from the general process of Indo-Europeanization around the world that it is enforced patriarchally through male exogamy, which means that Indo-European men go around and take wives out of native populations that they conquer. So I, if they're cousins, let's assume one of them married a, a corded ware woman from Sweden and the other one married a, a bell beaker woman from Spain. And that would explain why they're so uh, genetically distinct, but they're also related. And they both grew up in the same area. And they both have, from isotope analysis of the teeth, we can see that they were moved around at the ages of the early adolescence. So both of them were in one place when they were age six and a completely different place, age 13. So isotope analysis, you can see from the way the water affects your teeth when you're growing up. You can see on a skeleton that where they lived, sort of, roughly. So you have to base it on what, what, what areas have what kind of water. It's not a 100% science, but you can definitely say that these guys didn't grow up in the Wessex area around Stonehenge uh, and they didn't spend their teenage years there. But it's possible that they were spent their teenage years in Wales, maybe, of one of the many places. But why were they moved there? Indo-Europeans have a cultural phenomenon called the Männerbund. It's the German word is the only word that's generally used nowadays. It's when bands of young men form together in warrior packs like wolves, and they're sent out away from their societies to go and uh, turn into men through a kind of ri a ritual of initiation into acceptance of their society. To do so, they have to leave society and prove themselves as warriors in their own right. Even scavengers, in a way. We can see examples in later Indo-European cultures, such as uh, among the Norse. You've got the Viking phenomenon, where young men leave their country in boats, go to other places, raid other cultures. They just steal whatever they can, basically. Bring it back to their culture, show that they've got gold, show that they've got wealth, show that they're capable warriors, and then they suddenly raise their social standing and are regarded as men in their culture. In ancient Greece, you had the Spartans, whose young men were basically like forced into a criminal lifestyle. They had to steal to survive. They weren't allowed to be nurtured by their own culture anymore, but they had to depend on theft in order to live. But theft was illegal at the same time, so they had to be very wily in order to survive. And this is something we can see in lots of Indo-European cultures, because that's actually how Indo-European culture spread. It's quite likely that this, you know, what started as just a way of dealing with young men and getting rid of them for a while develops into a formalized means for the spread of the culture. Like these warrior bands spread out and found new societies. That's probably how Anglo-Saxons came to conquer England. That's probably what Romulus and Remus were when they, the, the Romans uh, founded that culture in the Italian peninsula. And that's what's happening on the Salisbury Plain in the late Neolithic. So in their teenage years, the Boscombe Bowmen may have headed out to Wales to try and 
prey upon the poor Neolithic people there and see what they could get out of them. And uh, in their later years, becoming great men, they could have the privilege of being buried with other family members of theirs in a mass grave of sort, a family grave, right near Stonehenge, which was a central seat for the new Beaker culture, because we can see there's so many barrows there, even though it had been the central you know, aspect of the Neolithic European culture with this great henge, all around the highest concentration of Bronze Age barrows, of Beaker barrows in Britain, this is a place that was very important to the Beaker people too. So people buried around there must have been pretty privileged. So I would imagine that all those guys in that burial had this kind of familial relation. Either they were all related by blood or at least they were all um, part of the same warrior tribe, the warrior Manabund. And it was already believed that they were related before the DNA was done because their skull shapes were so similar. The Belbica people of the Lower Rhine area of Holland often have this very rounded skull, very brachycephalic, uh, with a flat occiput, which is the back part of their skull. Um, it turns out that these two guys, the Boscan Bowmen, weren't actually Belbeka from the Lower Rhine area, or they may have been partially, but they certainly weren't typical because they, one of them is more Indo-European than the average uh, Northern Belbeka person, and the other is less Indo-European than the average Belbeka person. But this is an interesting sort of look into how this area was settled, because these two guys were not first-generation immigrants to the British Isles because otherwise they couldn't have had this proportion of ancestry. It obviously had to be like second-generation or third-generation immigrants and they, they got these, uh, they're, you know, they're, they're very northern, the one with the Nordic ancestry and the one with the southern ancestry. These are, some, these are from back on the days of the continent before they moved in. So something interesting has happened here. This shows also that there are different types of Belbica people coming in. It isn't homogeneous among what Belbica folk are coming. The greater majority of the Belbica immigrants were from the Holland area and they all have that similar skull shape, similar genetic profile. They're actually all one race. And then they're related cousin peoples of the same culture around the continent from as far north as Denmark and as far south as Spain. Some of them maybe came in too, but what, how did they all know about it? You know, how did they all coordinate this migration over such a large area? Well, it shows, in my opinion, that the Beaker folk had a... The Beaker culture had contacts across it. So even though there was a genetic diversity, like Spanish bell beakers aren't really related very much to the Dutch bell beakers, but the Dutch bell beakers have a genetic interflow with the corded ware culture and the, or the single grave culture with, uh, of, um, to their east. We might even speculate that Stonehenge and Avebury and these late Neolithic monuments were in fact the attraction that started the Belbeaker invasion. Like people on the continent heard about these amazing structures never before seen. Even to this day, 5,000 years later, people marvel at Stonehenge. How would people across the water have thought of these amazing structures? Surely it would attract the attention of young warrior bands of men who knew they could win fame and glory if they went and conquered those people. And from what we know of the, the Neolithic peoples, they weren't as war-based as the Indo-Europeans who came later, so it was easy pickings. And they must have been wealthy. All the people who were there at Stonehenge building, they had to be paid in something. Were they paid in grain? In cattle? Not in gold, because they didn't use gold too much. Gold was more the Belbeakers thing. They brought lots of gold jewellery in. But whatever they were being paid in these early builders, they had to be camped around that area, they had to live around the area, they had to be supplied with food for their families. But as far as the Belby people were concerned, food, that's up for grabs. Women, up for grabs. Cattle, up for grabs. They're just going to go there and take it all. And you start to see maybe a narrative, I'm forming a narrative here about how this might have happened. No wonder Stonehenge was a place that the Belbica people immediately started settling and having their burial mounds. This was the thing that drew them in the first place. And then it might explain as well why you're not just getting them from Holland. You're getting them from further afield in Germany and France coming in as well because word is spreading across the Belbica world on the continent that there is a great opportunity in Britain. And uh, the result was disastrous for the Neolithic peoples of Britain, but fabulous for the new ascendant Belbica culture which took its place and from which we modern Britons descend. This theory is brand new and it's based on the latest science. 
We need more archaeological evidence and more genetic evidence to understand exactly what happened with the Bell Beaker invasion of Britain. But I hope you'll find my theory convincing and at least thought-provoking. If you have any criticisms, please leave them in the comment section, but try to make them constructive. Also, if you really like this video, then please click subscribe and check out some of my other videos. I make videos about Indo-Europeans, about history, genetics, all kinds of things, especially religion. And if you really want to help this channel out, then just send me a donation, one-time donation on PayPal, or become a donor on Patreon, and then you get uh, special videos that are only for patrons. And don't forget, I also have some merchandise available on teespring.com and on patriotwear.co.uk. You can check out some cool Indo-European t-shirts there. Thanks again for watching. This has been Survive the Jive.